In this video, we're going to look at the Carnot cycle, but this time run in a counterclockwise direction on the PV or TS diagram. This is what it looks like. I've drawn the TS diagram because the Carnot cycle is a rectangle. It's a lot easier to draw than on the PV diagram. The arrowheads indicate that now the cycle is going counterclockwise. We never really discussed this earlier, why we always chose a clockwise cycle, but now let's look at it going in the other direction. Let's talk through each one of these steps and uh, see what's happening. So starting in this bottom left corner, label that as corner one. The system starts at a state of low entropy and low temperature, so it's cold and it's small. And the first thing it does is it moves to the right. It gains entropy. Right? So between corner one and corner two, the working substance is actually uh, heating up, right? It's, it's gaining heat isothermally. And one thing that we know about absorbing heat is that the second law of thermodynamics uh, tells us that we can only absorb heat from an object that is hotter than uh, we currently are. So when this uh, working substance moves from one to two, it must be in contact with the reservoir that has a temperature that is higher than T1. Okay, I'm not going to draw a line for a reservoir on there right now because there's a little bit of uh, uh, ambiguity of where that line could be. Anywhere above T1 works, but I want, to, I want to put it in a specific place later on. So that's what happens on 1 to 2. On the next leg of the cycle from 2 to 3, we are uh, keeping a constant entropy, right, S2. So that's an adiabatic uh, heating. We raise our temperature adiabatically. So what does it mean to raise your temperature adiabatically? This means that you're compressing the working substance very quickly and uh, raising its pressure, raising its temperature to some high level. Okay, so two to three would be uh, a sequence when, if you're talking about a gas in a piston, we uh, jam the piston in very rapidly. Okay, from three to four, we are now isothermal again at some other temperature, higher temperature T3, but we're moving to the left, we're decreasing entropy, and uh, that requires us to eject some heat. So again, that's isothermal. And we're ejecting heat. And we want to keep in mind that when we eject heat, second law states that we must be in contact with a colder reservoir to do that. And our final step, four to one, is again adiabatic. This time we're reducing temperature. So we have an adiabatic cooling. Uh, here I should say adiabatic heating. Okay, so that's the basic analysis of each of the four steps of the cycle. But, but what's really going on here? Why would we care about a cycle that goes counterclockwise? So let's focus in to answer that question on the two isothermal stages. This is where we do something with heat. This is where we learn kind of what the, what the cycle does. On one to two, we're absorbing heat. And this is peculiar now because we're absorbing heat when we're at a low temperature, right? We're absorbing heat at our lowest temperature of the cycle. So we have the potential here to absorb heat from a reservoir that's anywhere hotter than T1. Let's put a cold reservoir, Tc, 
at kind of the minimal level above T1 that would allow us to absorb heat from it. I don't want to put this way above because then the cycle would be somewhat uh, uninteresting. We'll see why in a bit. So let's say we absorb heat from 1 to 2 from this temperature reservoir at Tc, right there in the middle of the temperature range of the cycle. The other interesting step is from 3 to 4. Here we are ejecting heat, but we're doing that when our working substance is at its highest temperature. So we're getting, we're, we're getting heat out of the system when it's hot. So that's also backwards from the engine. To do that, we have to eject heat to some reservoir, some other object that's colder than the current temperature of the working substance. Let me draw a line for a hot reservoir right there, just kind of the minimal amount below the temperature T3 to allow 3 to 4 process to eject heat. So with these two reservoirs, Let's think about what's happening in terms of an energy diagram. Right, I draw my cycle this time counterclockwise. I have the hot reservoir at the top, the cold reservoir at the bottom. <clears throat> from step one to two, I absorb heat from the cold reservoir, so I'm actually seeing some heat come into the system from TC. So I'll draw my heat arrow from the cold reservoir into the cycle and label that with a positive value of QC. So QC is actually representing now a heat absorbed and it's a positive number. When we're in contact with the hot reservoir, we're ejecting heat. So energy is going from the substance to the reservoir. So that will be a heat ejected. I'll draw the arrow pointing up, because that's the direction of energy flow. I'll label this with a positive value of QH. And QH would be the opposite of the heat we would get from taking the difference between a final step of 4 and an initial spot of 3. Right. Yep, QH goes out of the system into the reservoir. QC goes out of the reservoir and into the system. Got it. Okay, so these are our two heats on here. Now, we know from our expression for heat absorbed that heat values are corresponding to areas on this graph, right? So when I move from 1 to 2, that area is QC. When I go from 3 to 4, this area as like an absolute area would be QH. Uh, we make it negative because the, um, the arrow goes to the left. So clearly QH and QC are uh, different from one another. QH is uh, larger than QC. And that means that in our energy diagram, this cycle requires some work input. So we get a constitution of energy equation for this cycle that looks like QC goes in uh, work goes, uh, a W value goes in, and that equals a uh, heat output of QH. Okay, so hopefully you can see how this equation then corresponds to this energy diagram. Uh, so our conclusion about what this cycle does is a bit profound. It absorbs heat at a low temperature from a low, from a cold area, and ejects heat at a high temperature to a hot area, right? So if the reservoirs are uh, are not actually 
well, if they're infinite, then their temperatures just stay at Tc and Th. But if these reservoirs are not quite so large, then this cycle can actually pull heat out of the cold object at the bottom, reducing its temperature, and eject heat into this object at the top, raising its temperature. So we've got a situation here where we, by running the cycle, we're making a cold object colder and a hot object hotter at the same time. And that seems to violate the second law of thermodynamics, right? Because heat is only supposed to flow from hot to cold, and here it's going from cold to hot. The reason that it uh, doesn't actually violate the second law is that this cycle requires work input. So somewhere else in the universe, something else has to happen to produce that work that can go into here and kind of uh, induce the flow of heat from cold to hot. This type of cycle that uh, lowers the temperature of a cold reservoir and raises the temperature of a hot reservoir we call a refrigeration cycle. If the reservoirs are not infinitely large, we can actually say, say Tc is the inside of a room and Th is the outside atmosphere. We can cool the inside of the room at the cost of putting in some work, designing a piston to do this cycle, and at the cost of expelling some waste heat to the outdoors. So our conclusion for this counterclockwise Carnot cycle is that it can act as a refrigerator, removing heat from a cold area and ejecting it to a hot area.